Are you ready? Ready. Okay. With most drugs, there's a long pre-established history of what the activity is going to be like. That is not the case with efavirenz. Really the only way to crack that kind of a mystery is to take the drug. That is what psychopharmacology is. I don't necessarily think it's going to be mind-blowing, but uh, time will tell. South Africa has one of the planet's most unique drug cultures. It is a realm where the quaalude still abounds, and heroin has emerged only recently, not in its familiar guise as an intravenously administered powder, but as a component in a mysterious smoking mixture called niope. A drug that's torn communities apart, made from a volatile cocktail of red poison, heroin, and ARVs. The drug efavirenz was first approved by the FDA in 1998 and has since become a vital component of the antiretroviral drug cocktails that are used to treat HIV internationally. Apparently some people don't go to clinics now to go and get their ARVs because they are scared they get robbed and those are then uh, added to this concoction as well. Although prescription drug abuse is not uncommon, this was the first I'd heard of an antiretroviral drug being used recreationally, and the suggestion that it behaved like a classical psychedelic further kindled the fires of my obsession. And so I traveled to South Africa to find out what role, if any, efavirenz plays in the Niope cocktail and what effect it might have on the recreational user. Venturing into the township Soweto, I met with a local group willing to share their expertise on drug acquisition and consumption. They mix Nyaupe with Daka. You understand what I'm saying? With marijuana. Yes. Yeah, so they put it inside there. They mix it with it. Yes. Then they smoke it. Yes. Yeah. As I entered the den, I could smell the remnants of heroin and methamphetamine and methcathinone and methacolone and cannabis. We're currently in the home of Niope users and we're going to get a walk through the process of how Niope is formulated. We're going to see all the different components that go into the mixture and maybe even watch some people ingesting it. This is the home of the parents of the users who've since passed away, and now this has become something of a drug den, or so I've been told. I'm Hamilton. Yeah. We must educate other Americans. It's not marijuana, it's marijuana. Marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you smoke in your open, this time, the feeling you, you get oh, is nice. Drowsy, uh, but uh, others they, they vomit when they smoke the uh, first time. A lot of people have been saying that Niope contains some kind of HIV medicine. Like you take red poison, rat and then you take ARV. Rat poison? Yeah. Yeah, rat Why would you put rat poison in it? Yeah, I, I reckon it is dangerous, but I think it also has a high or something. Yeah. 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 To be strong. You personally put the rat poison no, in? No, 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 no. no. The person who makes it. Yeah. 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 As soon as you take a first shot, you feel great because the morphine and the strychnine, they are cancelling out. And so you're getting the effect from the morphine. But when the morphine wears off, the, the, uh, those products, the, the strychnine is still in your body causing the pain. And it's every four hours that they have to have a shot because the body hurts. 
Since the 1960s, reports of street drugs laced with the rat poison strychnine have been perpetuated by the popular media. Most of these claims are false. But when I read that an analytical chemist in Durban had detected strychnine in a niope sample, I decided to pay him a visit. Do you, do you have anything from the analysis or from previous analysis that you could show us? No, we, we did that. We had to get permission to do that. We did that stuff and that data was given to these people. I guess just given how dangerous strychnine is, it seems like there'd be a huge potential for killing people, especially- That's what I don't get. That's the other thing. I even ask myself, why are these people not dying yet? Because strychnine is the ancient poison. That thing's been used to kill kings and royalty and important statesmen for a long, long time. But you did this analysis. And I found the strychnine. Yeah. But if you want a fresh analysis, it's possible for me to do it. Now that you've brought up this question and this point about that you don't think that it's there, that the strychnine is there, and I found the strychnine here from these ones, I'm also curious. And for us to run the analysis for you would not take more than a few hours. If I take you now to buy some, are we off camera? Under the cover of night, we went to obtain a fresh niope sample from a recent drug bust. Over here in Durban, they call it sugars because it looks like brown sugar. So they sell it in straws. They take a straw and they put a little amount in it and then you, you twist it. So if you buy it now, you're buying it in that straw and it's, this, it's really a dirty color. Fresh niope in hand, we return to the laboratory to look for the presence of strychnine or efavirins. If you think about it, the sample set that they brought us was just from one dealer. And uh, it just so happens that we know who the single dealer is. And uh, it's a big dealership. So I really find it hard to believe that you could get that large amount of ARVs to be adding to this, to get the significant effect of it out of an ARV. So this contour plot here shows you the UV activity. Yes. Okay, of the molecules. If it's an ARV, it's gonna have decent UV activity, and the only four compounds that have this UV activity are these things. So, clearly this is just dirty heroin. No strychnine. Heroin is a very well-covered, well-established drug of abuse, and uh, it's not something I'm particularly interesting in rehashing. But here's the this, thing, you know, heroin exists all over the world. world. Yeah. What I'm interested in specifically is the ARV thing. Even if it's fake or whatever, I just want to understand it. I want to know, is I this something? it's that... not even a hallucinogen. They don't see things, they just become super high. They just become high? Super high. That's what it sounds like to me as well. Like they get really high, really crazy, but it doesn't quite sound like they're tripping to me. And you know, there's all these stories in the sun that are talking about how people will rape women so that they can get HIV, so they can get the ARVs to smoke, all this stuff. It seems really sensational to me. No, Let's not forget, that is a tabloid newspaper. Yeah. Do you understand? But I won't necessarily say it's lies because there's truth to everything, you know? This is South Africa, my man. There's a lot that goes on, you know? But you must get the, yeah. the concrete in information there mustn't be lies in it. Coupling of sickness with social welfare money in a very resource uh, poor setting is often fertile grounds for these kinds of rumors. In order to gain further insight into the psychoactivity of efavirins, I met with South African anthropologist Isaac Nyhaus. Do you have any idea 
how much of these things are potentially some kind of journalistic or tabloid fabrication or construction. Yeah, these, the, there's always an aura of factuality in these stories. And uh, I think the reason for that is that when uh, people who are HIV positive use affavorance, one of the side effects is extremely bizarre dreams of standing on mountains, of being attacked by animals, of uh, deceased people walking around in their house. Many Africans believe that the ancestors would send you dreams, that God would communicate through dreams. And then they see here is a drug that can similarly induce dreams and can create images and so on. So there is a, a kind of a mystical power to this drug. I had already spoken with active users, but I wanted to meet with Niopi addicts in recovery to hear their perspective on what the Niopi mixture might contain. It's a concussion of heroin and other substances, your red poison. Chemicals to use to clean the toilets, uh, chemicals they use to clean the dishes in the kitchen. Your family planning tablet. They, they are adding family planning tablets to it. Yeah, and they call it Niopi. I don't have AIDS, you see, or HIV and red poison, and I'm not a rat, you see. Those things are not good for me. Actually, I think a lot of people, they think they're buying heroin, you know, pure heroin, but it never comes pure because, you know, from where it comes from, as it makes its way through Africa, you know, they keep adding all this because the volume decreases, so they want to make more profit and they add this stuff. You know, so you might find maybe it's 50% heroin and the rest is, you know, all this added stuff. Slowly, it became clear that Niopi was a complex mixture containing near infinite combinations of heroin, cannabis, brodifacum, efavirins, emtricitabine, strychnine, tenofovir, and oral contraceptives. I called Ted Leggett, a UN researcher who studied drug abuse in South Africa since the mid-90s. I got to South Africa in 1995, which was just after the end of apartheid, and there wasn't a lot of heroin around then. The two places it started out, for whatever reason, was in white communities in uh, Pretoria and Cape Town. And it was being dealt primarily by East Africans at that time, the, the primary areas of Pakistan, and Iran, and um, uh, where the, the drugs were coming from. Uh, on the question of why heroin wasn't there, well, I mean, you have to keep in mind that it, it wasn't because of the, the borders were impermeable. People moved money and guns and drugs, so it wasn't because you couldn't get it across the border. It was because, uh, you know, drugs require a culture. They require a supporting culture. I mean, it, one of the things that really struck me is when, when heroin started getting into some parts of the black community, they had no context for it at all. They just didn't, they hadn't seen train spotting. They didn't think about these things as, you know, they didn't have this history with it. Back in Soweto, we met with a local man who had been robbed of his money and plates by a gang of Niobe addicts. They just steal anything, <laughs> money, plates, anything that they can lay their hands on. As you can see, this tap uh, was stolen, so that's why the, there is this water. I've replaced it three times. Only the people who, who do this and get money for Nyaopi, it's for no other purpose. I don't want to talk about crime, 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 but I've been living in South Africa for, I mean, my entire life. And uh, the first time that I've been a victim of crime was a few months ago where someone broke into my house and stole my, my video games. That was it. And that's only because of this drug problem that we are having. We just take people things, they do housebreakings, maybe washing, maybe when people wash their clothes and put it there, you steal the clothes. You see, that's why these people are mad now. Even if they find you stealing and they know that you are smoking now, but they hit you to kill you, they kill you. Mob justice. 
they say criminals sometimes smoke these drugs so that they do not have any fear, that they can be fairly ruthless in their crime. We just arrived at the clinic where there was recently a Niope-related robbery. And we're about to meet with the doctor who's in charge of dispensing the antiretroviral drugs that have been stolen in order to be used as a component in the mysterious Niope mixture. And last August, uh, two guys came in and then they knocked as if they were patients. And then uh, they were armed. And then the first thing that they said is, where is the medicine cabinet? They wanted the ARVs. This is called ephedrine, 600 milligram. I tried it myself. I was just experimenting. Experimenting? Yeah. And I felt what people were feeling. You feel lightheaded. And then there's that feeling of inhibition. You can do anything you want. I mean, I can just urinate here in front of you. You know, you've got all the powers. You can bulldoze everyone. That's why these boys, they mean they come and do burglary and whatever, because they feel that, you know what, they are on top of the world, they can do anything. Mixing it with other stuff, the potency goes Higher. You can have one. Thank you, yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would like a... You can have one. Would it be possible for me to get quite a few of them? Maybe yeah, yeah. pay for them, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. No, 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 I don't have to, don't have to, don't have to. Oh, wow, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, yeah, you can have them. Yeah. Thank you. Not a problem. Yeah, don't take all of them. Of course not. <laughs> That's actually the first authoritative description I've heard of the effects of ephavirins. So interesting. It sounded like it had a disinhibiting effect, but it didn't sound like a classically psychedelic effect. So, I, you know, I was hesitant to try it because the idea of taking an antiretroviral drug recreationally in a country where HIV is a massive problem uh, just seems like the sort of thing that would make people go crazy. But because the doctor actually gave me 30 tablets and specifically instructed me to take one, I feel like I have no choice but to try it once and, and characterize the effects. Are you ready? Ready. And the time right now is... 12.43, I'm gonna start a timer. I have certain expectations based on the published binding data that it will behave like a classical psychedelic. It's certainly been connected with disturbing dreams or intense dreams or nightmares in certain instances, but really the only way to crack that kind of a mystery is to Take the drug. Take one tablet at bedtime, only. Yeah, just, just, just take one and then you, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Stronger now? Not really. I could talk to a cop. I could call my parents on the phone. There is definite activity, but then the actual character of the activity is unclear, and the duration of the activity is unclear. All you know is that there is a drug effect going on. So my interest in this came from a, a news report that I had seen uh, on a, a Saturday afternoon. Uh, where um, there was a report on um, people in South Africa 
uh, using a Favorand uh, recreationally. At the University of Texas, I met with John Setch, a pharmacologist who published a groundbreaking paper that demonstrated the unexpected activity of efavirenz as a classical psychedelic. Dr. Setch found that efavirenz can substitute for LSD in specially trained rats. Basically, they train um, a rat uh, in a lever press task, and they can discriminate or tell the difference by pressing a lever. So you train them up on, uh, let's say, LSD uh, versus saline. So one lever, they would press it if they uh, are experiencing saline, or they would press the other lever if they're experiencing um, LSD. What you do in those trained animals is then you substitute in uh, let's say your experimental drug, in this case it would be a favorenz. And so in rats trained to discriminate LSD from saline, when we substituted in a favorenz, a drug they had never experienced, they pushed the lever saying that it was like LSD. Um, we were prevented from testing even higher doses, but at higher doses of a favorenz, the animals don't uh, press levers, and so you're, you're sort of limited by how high a dose. I mean, there's a little, maybe a little trailing activity, maybe a tiny bit of trailing, a tiny bit. Because the effect is already so subtle, I'm going to go forward and take a full 900 milligrams. Although there's no way to evaluate whether or not a rodent is hallucinating, Scientists have discovered that classical psychedelics induce a unique effect in mice and rats. That effect is called the head twitch response. They mark with an asterisk to alert you that the head twitch response will occur. It's very rapid. There it was. <laughs> if you're not looking, you'll miss it. Uh, you see that application of the same concentration of efavirenz doesn't produce head twitch in the knockout mouse, uh, suggesting that the head twitch response is being mediated through the 5-HT2A receptor. 5-HT2A is a subtype of serotonin receptor that plays an important role in the activity of classical psychedelics. When activity at 5-HT2A is blocked, genetically or pharmacologically, rodents no longer display the head twitch response. We're in Linville, near Whitbank, on our way to meet some Niobe dealers who are going to be cutting their product with antiretroviral drugs, supposedly. Whether or not this will actually take place is unclear, especially because they're using the word cook somewhat ambiguously, and I don't know what cooking really means in this context. As we approached the lair of the clandestine Niobe cooks, I prepared myself to finally understand the logic behind their strange recipe. How did you come upon this particular formula? How did you decide that all of these different ingredients would be useful in the final product? You see, every nation did two parts to formulate this thing. You see, when we are together, people with different ideas, we combine them, we come up with one big thing. Though I had remained skeptical throughout my research, when I saw the ARV tablets on the table of the cutters, I was forced to confront the possibility that the stories were true. There's a guy that came from Nigeria by the name of Olum. He's the one who came with the formula. Who do you think taught him? He said he thought by his uncle, the uncle of his was looking for another Chinese guy who was staying in Jovek. These guys learn their recipes, and then when they have the recipe, that's their stock and trade. Because it's a secret, there's no Darwinian action to the idea. Because they don't really understand how it's happening. They just learn somebody's taught them how to do this. When we grind the red text, we don't just take the, the too much of it, just the little bit. The thing is the dizziness. Your is here with me, but your mind will be on the other side of town, you see. It's hard to tell what's actually having a pharmacological effect and how much of it's just 
tradition or folklore. These pills, they give it um, a power down, uh, to make you drunk. They store it at the clinics, at the hospital, then they supply us. Probably the antiretrovirals are a minor part of the, the orchestra there, just because it's available. Despite the fact that it's actually very, it's a very expensive drug, um, it, uh, it's, it's around, people have got access to it, so they, put, they toss that in this tube as well. And I see that you have three different antiretroviral drugs there. Do you think that one of them is better than the others? It's just when you take this one and this one, you make a mixture, it becomes the power of this one. After introducing a teaspoon of Ratax pellets and saturating the crushed powder with apple cider vinegar, the Niope cooks wrapped the pink paste in aluminum foil and placed it in a microwave. I think this, this is largely drug use born out of poverty and boredom. People are obviously experimenting with a lot of things until they get it right. You see, to avoid certain things, we took the foil out. And so if you had a choice between pure heroin or the Niope mixture that you make, which would you choose? No, I would choose this one because it's a little bit better. So if you use the pure opium tar from the poppy plant, you'd expect very bad stomach pains. Yes. But if you put rat poison into that tar, it actually makes the stomach pains less severe. Yes, yes, yes. Not too much of it. Because we are cooking, this thing it affects us more than the one who smoke. You see, my original body is not like this. My original color is not like color. this. When you see my photos before, now, sometimes I cry. And the journey continues. Uh, so we make the assumptions that uh, the studies that we do in animals will uh, translate one-to-one -one into humans and that that may uh, not be true, it may only be partly true. We never had the, tried to simulate having the rats smoke uh, the drug. Because recreational users smoke efavirins, the temperature could transform the chemical into an entirely different molecule. To test this hypothesis, I met with the medicinal chemist Jason Wallach to burn efavirins under controlled conditions. For this experiment, we're gonna use the entirety of the pill to try and simulate the exact conditions that the tablet is smoked in South Africa. Yeah, what's really cool is that this lab that I'm working at, we're building a machine that's like a, a machine that will smoke a tablet and then we can collect all of the smoke and chemically analyze it to see how the drug is changed when it's burned. It's kind of like a, a series of bongs that you use for smoking weed, all connected to one another with a vacuum on one side and a pipe on the other. And then you're able to just take out the water and analyze what's in it. Our hypothesis was correct. When heated under certain conditions, efavirins is transformed into an entirely different molecule, the pharmacology of which is unknown. Even the activity of the drug when it's consumed orally is something I'm just beginning to understand. I am fully effavirensed now. Oh man, is it, is it psychedelic in a certain way? I feel sedated, I feel relaxed. But I feel a connection to every other time that I've attempted to articulate a psychedelic experience in front of a camera right now. It feels like it's part of a continuum, a strange, eternal camera articulation continuum. You know, if you, if you feel the effect of weed, you can say, I'm stoned, and people will know I am under the influence of cannabis. If you say I'm drunk from alcohol, people will understand what that feels like. But if you say I'm effavirensed, I mean, you have to imagine there are literally thousands of 
targets for drugs in your body. Uh, I would venture to say that most drugs are interacting on more than one target. We would uh, certainly hope to develop um, drugs that wouldn't have uh, some of the side effect profiles that you currently see and that might also, we believe we could probably simultaneously engineer out any abuse potential uh, for the compounds. I would argue that in South Africa, adherence to antiretroviral drugs has actually been quite high. And I think the bizarre images and the very vivid dreams, um, they seem to create the impression that the antiretroviral drugs are very potent and very powerful, and that they're potent and powerful enough to fight a very powerful disease. Like the tingly stuff in the, you know, the anti-dandruff shampoo or whatever. Something that people, whether it has any actual effect on the condition or not, that actually lets people know, okay, you're experiencing a medical, a pharmacological effect now. When you consider that possibility, it seems like it could actually be detrimental to redesign the drug in such a way that it doesn't have any psychoactive properties anymore. Sure. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any controlled studies done on that, so I'd have to evaluate that, that data in terms of, of compliance. All right, okay, the mice uh, discriminated that stimulus correctly. A whole new world just opened up. A whole new pharmacophore, a whole new scaffold. This could be a completely new base structure to make new psychedelics. It could be an entirely new class. Everything improves, you know. The computer started being a big computer. Now we carry it, it's a laptop. The next time it won't be a laptop, it's just a wash. You know, everything changes. Afavirins is psychedelic. At the beginning of the piece, I said that you had to take the drug in order to understand it, and that's what psychopharmacology is all about, which is a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's true that there are certain questions in psychopharmacology that can't be effectively answered by a rodent. I hadn't seen anyone write, I've taken it, it is psychedelic, it's comparable to LSD. Nothing like that existed, and for that reason, I wanted to take it, and for that reason, it was useful to take it, because I answered my question, it is classically psychedelic. That said, it's not pleasant at all. Although the acute effects were somewhat enjoyable and comparable to mescaline, I was bedridden and totally incapacitated for almost two days afterwards. So this is something I've actually been very conflicted about reporting on. On one hand, I understand and feel a responsibility for conveying accurate information about this substance. But the possibility that anyone would divert this drug away from its intended medical purpose is actually very frightening. It is psychedelic, but so are lots of other things that are more potent, less expensive, and less toxic and dangerous to use at high doses.